Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Y'all give it up for the worship team. So, how many of you all have been to a Hope College track meet? By show of hands. Whoa. Okay, or yelling. All right, that works. Well, I have a track athlete with me. His name is J uh, Jagger Han. I'm always messing with his name. <laughs> he does uh, the javelin and he does the long jump. And he's a junior. He's from Cadillac, Michigan. I don't know where that is, but that's where he's from. And he's going to read the scripture today. He's also pre-med biology, so he's really smart. Thank you. All right, the scripture comes from 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 26. In a large house, there are utensils, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special use, some for ordinary. All who cleanse themselves of the things I have mentioned will become special utensils, dedicated and useful to the owner of the house, ready for every good work. Shun youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with stupid and senseless controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant that they will repent and come to know the truth, and that they may escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. This is the word of the Lord. I'll give it up for Jagger. Appreciate it. Though Paul, the Apostle Paul, is one of my biblical heroes, if I'm honest, his metaphors lose me sometimes, in part because he uses a lot of them, and at times he uses them concurrently and in rapid succession, one after another after another. Those with even a rudimentary grasp of the good book can attest to how allegory and hyperbole, come on English majors, and paradox and other rhetorical maneuvers can easily dislodge our modernist thinking caps. And this, of course, makes sense because the cultural points of reference and customs, even though there's nothing new under the sun of those in the Bible and its first audiences were, were just different than ours. Paul's metaphors in particular can feel a lot like heavy snow, heavy, heavy snow that accumulates faster than you can shovel. And before you know it, the snow removal experience has turned complex and it's cumbersome and it feels overwhelming. Maybe I'm talking to myself. If that is you, then, then well, I want you to know to fear not, for the Lord's yoke is easy and his burden is light. And since in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God today, like right now, there is a word from God for us. In Paul's second letter to his reliable protege, his co-laborer in sacred arms, this young brother named Timothy. Paul's letter, if you've read it before, focuses on correcting false doctrine and equipping Timothy to be an encourager of those who have chosen to plant their feet firmly in the soil of Christ's gospel. He opens 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 26 with this business about utensils of gold and silver and wood and clay in a large house, the text says. Some that are employed for limited exclusive means and some that find themselves being used every day, deficient of any esteemed label. A beautiful picture this is that, that Paul paints and, and yet I find myself a bit confused. Again, it may just be me, you don't see much clarity surrounding the significance, if there is any to begin with, that the metaphorical house in question is large as opposed to being small. I mean, why are these utensils not imagined to be in a tiny house on wheels or an RV? And, and why not maybe a houseboat? I mean, I can't swim, but I could understand the houseboat concept. And, and then, too, there, there isn't a clear-cut appraisal 
to distinguish the value of wood and clay utensils versus gold and silver utensils, or between special utensils and ordinary utensils. And while not addressing all of my questions, in verse 21, it appears that both concepts are remixed with new cohesion. When Paul writes, all who cleanse themselves of the things I have mentioned will become special utensils, dedicated and useful to the owner of the house, ready for every good work. The things the things that Paul is referring to that, that he's referenced elsewhere in his letter previously, they include the issue of false teachers, not to mention the allure some of the faithful have begin to, begun to follow those who abandon the faith. And he's also accentuated the need not to quarrel over words or engage in what he calls profane chatter, which spreads among communities like gangrene, like an infection. So turn away from wickedness. If you are one who calls on the name of the Lord, turn away from wickedness is Paul's hope for the people of God. And if they obey, they will have readied themselves for every good work, to be nimble, to be practical, to be wise, and of wide-ranging use in the kingdom of God. And in verses 22 through 25, we're told to choose the path of righteousness, and that's awesome, but I want us to zero in on verse 26. These people that Paul cautions Timothy about do not simply have noticeable character flaws. They are not, despite being rough around the edges, otherwise upstanding and well-intentioned. Come on, somebody. No, they have been ensnared by the devil. That's what the text says, the devil. You can say it with me one time, the devil. Similar to the alligator hunters on the History Channel. Y'all watch the History Channel? It's a, it's a good thing. The, the alligator hunters on the, the History Channel show called Swamp People, the enemy, of, the enemy of God tempted and captured these individuals in question by their own desires. They are not a special utensil, available for all manner of good work in God's gourmet soup kitchen. And you need to know, Hope College, that enrollment in, that means I'm talking to you if you're a student, and employment at, that means I'm talking to you if you're faculty or staff, at an institution connected to the Christian faith does not excuse you from commingling with people who take orders from the devil. Y'all could have said amen right there. You or your neighbor to the left or the right, maybe that's why you didn't say amen. It could be you. It could be you. You could be one who is held captive by him, the enemy, the devil, to do his will. And so you've got no problem spewing criticism from the cheap seats of anonymity. You've got no problems rejecting the inclusive exclusivity of Jesus and the bodily resurrection that will follow his coming again. Or, or maybe it's that wickedness has become your BFF, meaning that you're always down for whatever with little regret or memory of, of all that you've done to sow untamed oats. Maybe it's that as far as you're concerned, God is as fluid as you are, if he exists at all. Or perhaps it's that you are your own person, you say, you are an intellectual independent, you say. You are set apart from the irrationality of an abusive, patriarchal religion that caters to the weak. Kick rocks has been your, sal your salutation to Christians and their God. And meanwhile, the devil, the devil, the enemy of God is positioned to amen you all the way to hell. You could have said amen right there. Still, what I find exciting is that we play a part, we play a part according to God's will in stirring someone to possibly repent and come to know the truth. And so your job and my job is, is not to police the thoughts and lifestyles of everybody and their mama. That gets on my nerves. I don't got time for that. Your job is not to weigh in on every subject of every situation every time. You ain't that smart. Rather, 
The Lord's servant, Paul writes, must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone. An, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. Now, the longer I live, the less interest I have in arguing. I am busy, like most of you, I'm sure. I got stuff to do, places to go. I have sermons to prepare. I got weights to lift. I have meals to make in my crock pot. Living here, I got snow to shovel, and I have a wife to take care of. But, but I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so my encouragement to you today is that you invest in those who call on the name of the Lord with a pure heart, a pure heart, who have a, a hunger to pursue this kind of gospel-centric life the Bible teaches about. And, and to be honest, if that isn't your cup of tea and you may be here and you're like, that's not for me, just know that as long as you breathe, as long as you can inhale and exhale, as long as you, you are here, alive, in real and living color, it is never, ever too late to receive Jesus' pardon for your deceit. The, the job of the church is to love you whether or not you love our Savior. I'll say that again. The job of the church is to love you whether or not you love our Savior. Three times for the Trinity. The job of the church is to love you, to love people who do not believe perhaps what you believe, that they might come to know Jesus and they might come to experience salvation. Go in peace.